you want to do. Okay. Okay, good. So now we're recording. So this is our last session. And what I wanted to go over with you is a technique that I like to use if I'm if I want to add a nice big um, layer, like if I want to have layers on my uh, composition or on my artwork, like this kind of thing, if I turn it on the side, you'll see there's lots of layers. Um, I'm going to show you how we carve out and then we can add to it, but there's lots of buildup going on. So what I asked you to bring tonight is your corrugated cardboard that I sent you. And I save this stuff. I love it when I get boxes. And this is cool because this was a white box and it saved me from having to paint. Now you can paint this before we use it, but it's not necessary because um, you're gonna go on and start looking at your boxes when they come in the mail. And you're going to say, oh, that's a cool box. It's got a corrugated core. I'm going to I'm going to save that because this technique really doesn't work unless you have a corrugated box. So what we do is we take our cardboard and this to me is uh, really easy because it was a white box and it makes my demonstration to you a little easier when it's stark black and white. So I'm going to take, and I just had a Sharpie. I'm losing things already. Okay. What I'm going to do is tilt this down so you can see me and see if I can bring this in a little closer. All right. So I asked you to bring a stencil, but you don't have to bring a stencil um, only because I wanted you to have a shape. Now, what works best with open shapes. If you have a stencil that has a lot of filigree and lace work, it might not work. Well, I, I mean, it would work, but it makes so much work for you and it could be a bit frustrating. I just want to show you, this is where I use the stencil. I use like a fleur de -lis stencil on there and in the same family there. And that took me a while. So what I'm using tonight to demonstrate to you is this big open stencil and it's a bird. So I'm just going to lay my stencil down and now I'm gonna trace on to my cardboard the, the stencil image going on the inside of the stencil with a Sharpie and this is like a, a fine point. You could use a pencil because we're gonna be cutting this away. You're not going to be seeing the pencil or the, paint, or the ink line. So it doesn't really matter what kind of tool you, you mark making tool you use just as long as you get your image down there. Just going around my image and I've got my bird traced out. So it looks like that. I got the bird on there. Nice big image. So now what I'm going to do, this is where you're going to take your insacto knife and you want to use a sharp blade. Now the ones I sent you, I believe were brand new. So they, should, they have a brand new blade in them. But what I also want to show you is when I get an Exacto knife, because this is a knife, it will hurt you. It will make you bleed. I like to take a piece of tape. This is basic painter's tape and just wrap like a tag around it because now it won't roll off your desk and stab your foot, which has happened to me before. So now I just put a piece of tape on there so it's not gonna roll and hurt you. You also might wanna use, um, cause we're gonna cut now, you might wanna use a magazine or a, I have a, um, 
a cutting mat. This is a flexible cutting mat. You can, this is made by Alvin. They make all kinds of um, commercial art supplies. But you could use a magazine or a kitchen towel folded in half. I just don't want you to be doing this on a nice table because if your knife goes all the way through, which we don't want, it could mar your surface underneath. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna take our knife and if you never use an exacto knife before, it is like a scalpel and I hold mine like a pen with my dominant hand. And now I'm going to pierce the corrugated, but I'm going to pierce it on the outside of my line, my drawn line. I probably should have used a thicker Sharpie so you could see this better, but I'm going to pierce it on the outside. So when I pull this away, I won't see any, any um, Sharpie lines. So I'm going to follow with the line and you're just going to press down enough where you can feel the corrugation yielding. You don't want to go through all the way to the other side. So just think of yourself as like a surgeon and you're cutting, but you don't want to go so deep. You're just doing a little plastic surgery here and I'm removing the outer, going through the outer skin of it all. And we're gonna go around our image. It'll, you know, depending on how busy your image is, it will take you however long to go around your image. But take your time. And that's why I, I suggested doing a, um, a large open space. The busy part of my image here is the almost like a pinked edge, the zigzag edge of the bird's wing. It's not a straight line. So I'm rather than tur trying to turn my knife, I'm making a cut or I'm going through, I'm lifting up, turning my blade, cutting again, lifting up, turning my blade, because sometimes with the corrugation, it's hard to um, swivel back and forth. So sometimes I just pick up the blade and turn the whole knife and then reinsert it into the corrugation. And it doesn't have to be super exact. Your lines are a guide. And, and it, everybody's got their own style. Some people are very meticulous when it comes to their fussy cutting and other people don't have the patience and say, oh, I just wanna like get the general shape down and then I can go back in and refine. And you just want to make sure you don't go through to the other side. You'll know it. Because I, I think when you exert pressure now on your blade, you can feel that you're just going into the corrugation and it's not going all the way through to the second layer of the cardboard. Just finishing up around the head and the beak. And good. I cut all the way around it and I did not go through to the other side. So I'll give you a minute to finish up your shape before I take you to the next step.
Okay. All right. Are we ready to move on? Okay, great. So now you're going to take not just your Exacto knife, but do you have that wooden skewer? Another lethal weapon that will poke your eye out. Um, so we're gonna take our skewer. Well, you might have to start it with your knife, but you wanna find a corner or a point. I'm just gonna start it with my knife and all, and I. you wanna make sure if you're flicking a blade or even this skewer thing, do it away from you. Don't do it towards you. I'm, I'm trying to be really safe about this. I want to go start with the corner and I want to just pick it up. I might have to use my nail. And this is where I use my skewer thing. This is like my magic tool. And I am now going to rip away, start ripping away where I cut and to expose that inner corrugation like that. So you have to get your skewer thing into those, I guess they're like canals or crevices or channels between the hills of the corrugation in the middle and pull it up to reveal that really fun texture inside. And do it all around my shape. And some people like to um, get it all the way down to the core and other people like an irregularity. It's, uh, there's no one perfect way to do it. It depends if you want a little debris left behind. So your corrugated rows are a little uneven and um, other people are more uniform in how they want their artwork to look. I don't mind if there's some straggly little chunks left behind. It doesn't all have to be totally scraped out. Sometimes some, you know, like some lingering, a hanging chad makes it a little interesting. So that's why I like this skewer because I can get into that channel and lift up that top layer and give it a good rip. And then pull it away. This makes for a nice book cover. Now, if you are using this as a book cover, it is most effective to only do this on one side of the cardboard. Because if you try and do this on the other side of the cardboard, you're gonna make a hole. It's gonna go all the way through. So this is best used to um, like deep boss or what, I don't know, this is, how do, this I guess is deep bossing. You're taking away from the surface. And if your design is super fussy, it's gonna take you longer to, you know, to get out all of your corrugation and get in all those nooks and crannies. I would like to keep your mail on my email list so I can alert you to other classes I might be doing or shows coming up or things like that. I'm trying to develop a mailing list. I wish I had like a, a media director. <laughs> It's a full-time job just trying to keep up with the media. I agree. I'm trying to do a media thing. It goes 
I so time consuming. But yes, you're welcome to keep like keep my email for sure. Okay, thanks. Now, if you don't always have to use a stencil, I mean, you could do a free form thing, free form shape. Um, one of the things I was thinking of was my other piece of cardboard. Let me use a thicker Sharpie this time. Grab one. You could even make a shape like a star, just like that and then cut it out and then you have a star shape you don't have to use a stencil i'm going to quickly do this star because that will lend itself to the shapes i want to demonstrate next the techniques I'm going a little outside my lines there, but that's okay. And the thicker the cardboard, the you know, the deeper the hills and valleys are. So I'm, oh, whenever I get an interesting box, I always wonder if it's worth saving to cut up for the corrugation factor. It only works on boxes that have the core. It is messy in, in that it leaves a lot of paper shards all over the place, little rippage. I just want to get this shape out. That's the whole point of doing mixed media. <laughs> making a mess. Just making a mess and playing around. This is a fun process. It's so relaxing. To use the, you know, to use a little uh, knife yeah. and then that, yeah. Nice. Yeah. And like I said before, I don't need to have every little valley totally cleaned out. If there's a little rough uh, residue or if it doesn't come away entirely, that's what makes it a little interesting for me. If it was totally, I cleaned out every one of these valleys and made sure there was nothing, you know, stuck in between. It might look too machine rendered. It might not have that kind of rough and tumbled hand hewn look. Just gonna take out a little more of that core because in a couple places it's a little much, and I want to leave a little of it for interest. All right. So what I've done is just take that freeform star and I left, as you can see, I left some of the, I didn't scrape it out. So it's totally clean. If I was a 
a dental hygienist, I'd be fired. But I kind of like rough stuff left behind. So now, oh my God, it looks like there was a, a confetti parade here. Um, okay, so now what you can do, you can find interesting 3D elements to add on top of this. Now that we have debossed, so to speak, and taken away elements, uh, taken away from the surface. Now we can add to the surface. You can, but what I like to say um, many times, well, what did I do with them, is um, Scrabble letters. Scrabble letters are, are fun elements. You can also get these kind of like 3D journaling letters that you can glue down and then you can add um, paint to or whatever. But this is just some wood shapes that I picked up at Target. And they're just these, all this assemb assembling of um, wooden shapes. I'm gonna pick out the stars because I wanna keep the star thing going. So that comes in all different sizes. They make it also in cork. You can get cork shapes. The cork sometimes is a little fragile. Sometimes it di disintegrates with over uh, manipulation where the wood is more sturdy. Oh, so, you know what? It's a good thing I only wanted three stars because that's all I'm, all I'm finding. But these little shapes are kind of star-like too. I might separate those out. I'm not gonna discount anything. Any possibility might be happening. So, what I'm now going to show you is, yeah, I'm gonna need more stars, I think. If you are using, when we use paper, matte medium is great. Matte medium is kind of like in consistency most of the time. This is uh, like runny, runny yogurt maybe, or it's, it's thicker than whole milk or half and half. So maybe it's kind of like runny yogurt. But if you're going to be using a heavier element, especially something that's metal, you want to use an equally heavier medium. And this is a heavy gel. This is more of the consistency of toothpaste or putty. So I'm going to just put on a pair of gloves because my hands are taking a beating lately. And the, the thickness of the adhesion is kind of commensurate with the thickness of the elements that you're gluing. You can even use bath, bathtub caulk, which works fine too. Very similar to um, this ultra heavy mold. And it's also known as molding paste. You can pass this stuff through a stencil. You can scrape it through a stencil with a credit card and it will make that nice raised effect. So I'm just going to now glue some stars onto my cardboard. And because they are wood, I am going to use the heavy gel. And this stuff, let me show you, let me show you how goopy it is. See, it's like, it's thick. It's not going to fall off the spoon. This is like pudding. This is really thick stuff. And I'm just going to put it down and, you know, put my stars down. I, there were only three in that box. So it's a good thing I like things in threes. And sometimes with this matte gel, because it is heavy, 
you want to go around and I even want to put a star in the corrugated area. So it's like not just turn it this way. I'm not just adding it here. I'm adding one there. And because this gel is so thick, I want to go back and take my skewer and I just want to neaten up because sometimes you get that extra little, I don't know what to call them. They're like boogers. They're like glue globs that you don't, you want to get them while they're wet because if they, they're, if they dry, then you almost have to sand them off. But I just don't want any globs of glue appearing where the star meets the surface. You know, just well-crafted, you know, like anything. You want to do a good job of it and have control of the materials. So it makes you look like a better artist when you know how to use the materials. That's the tools are half the work, having the right tools. So now I'm going to let this dry a couple minutes because what I'm going to do next is think about colorizing it. I do want to soak this, put this foam thing in water. Oh, good. I remembered water. So what you can do, like what I did on these other two, is I very roughly took white gesso and scraped it over the cardboard, but I didn't want to get it in the nooks and crannies because I wanted to keep that contrast. Same thing with this, this little book. This was another class that I did where um, the theme was different European cities. And this is like a flip book and every page is a collage of a different um, city. But I, and the covers, I did that. Now on some of these covers, where is the one I'm looking for? Of course, it's not the one I can find. Okay, on this one, I only wanted to get that silver metallic ink in the grooves. I didn't want to get it all over the place. So if you want to bump up your contrast, you can elect to either color in the grooved area with a different color paint or not color the grooved area at all and just do the top or, <laughs> or and on here, I added all these elements at, on top of this, oh, I, don't have any more, but see this really cool net kind of stuff. This you get in a hardware store. This is dry mount tape. Is that what they call it? I guess they use it when they're joining wall seams and then they smear it up with all kinds of uh, paste or whatever the skim stuff that they skim coat I don't know what they do but it makes a really cool surface texture and it's tacky on one side when it comes off the roll of tape so you just have to put it down you don't have to glue it but I like to glue that put glue on my surface on my substrate put this tacky drywall tape down and then put a coat of matte medium. So it's all, all the, you know, it's all glued because the last thing I want to have happen is to have some of this stuff start flicking off. Now here I used a bottle cap. And again, I used that um, super gel, the molding paste, because I want this to adhere. 
And I have all kinds of elements that I've glued down before I painted it. And then I elected what elements I want to have stand out. Like I have this branch in, um, in copper. Same thing on the front. Certain elements I painted on top of the others to help them stand out. Now, what is also a fun thing is spray paints. And if you're using a water-based spray paint, like a dilution, that, do I have my sprays up here? No. Um, a dilution, that's going to be water-based. So you want to make sure that um, you don't add any more water elements on top of it. If you use an acrylic ink or acrylic spray paint, please do it outside. Don't, I, I know some people have, who have spray boxes, which is essentially a three-sided box and they stick their thing in the box and they spray it. But now all those fumes are coming back at you. There are so many art supplies that are toxic. You know, back in um, Michael Angelo's days, the, the cobalt blue and some of these, um, especially the lead-based ones, they can really hurt you. So when I'm using sprays, I wear a mask. I do it outside or in my garage with the garage door open. I have a big tarp around because sprays, you don't, you might not think it carries, but if there was a gust of wind and you're spraying in your garage, now you're, you've got paint on your car or something like that. It, it's, it's not cool. So give yourself a lot of, um, Ventilation, that's the word I'm looking for. Okay, so I'm gonna get my craft mat. I don't know if you'll use these, this is pretty well worn, but I think Ranger makes this. It's like a waxy or a shiny kind of um, oil skin paper or, or some kind of cloth. Kind of reminds me of the old fashioned plastic tablecloths my grandmother might have used in the 50s or 60s. But this, this is acrylic paint on here. I suppose I could scrub it off. Oh, yeah, it'll peel off. But it's a great way to protect your surface if I don't want all these little tables to get um, paint on them. So, what I'm going to do now is just to freely apply some paint. This is just an acrylic paint. Um, I'm gonna get a little paint palette. I like using palette paper when I use a heavy body acrylic paint because it's just really disposable and easy. And I've been using a lot of acrylics lately. So this is an interesting color blue. Go with the stars and I'm just going to start painting my 3D surface, wet my brush. You always want to use a damp brush. You never want to take a dry brush and jam it into a, um, a pool of paint. Mix this up. And I'm just going to start painting my surface. And I think I might even go into the groves, but of the corrugation, but I don't know if I'm going to completely saturate every hill and valley. I might take, this is like stippling, where you're giving like a, a you're pouncing your brush. So there's some pigment getting into the corrugation but I'm not going to make sure, I'm not going to stroke every channel to make sure it's fully covered with the paint. That's just a look that I want. 
Um, there are no rules about this. You can do it as fussy as you want. I have a friend who loves mixed media and she admits that she is so super anal. Every time she does this channel, she's got to carve out every little remnant. She doesn't want any little danglers. She wants clean channels. That's just the way she is. That's fine. What I do want clean is where my star meets the, the substrate. I do not, just like my glue, I do not want globs. I want to take the tip of my brush and make a smooth surface join between my stars and my substrate because the gloppiness looks sloppy. And there's a difference between something that might appear, someone who, you know, who's not familiar with art might look at a Jackson Pollock and think that it's sloppy. But when I see sloppy artwork, I look at the craft of it all. Is it poorly? constructed or uh, you got to take pride in your work and that is not synonymous with realistic looking artwork there's a difference content and craft are two different things so I, yeah, I like the way this looks where I'm just giving a pound to my corrugated area. So it's pretty much the top, the peak of the corrugation is getting some color and I'm not grinding my um, pigment into all the channels. I like the contrast. And because this is only an hour long class. I did not add all the elements that you may, or the, or the layers you may have seen um, on some of the other books, like where's the one that had the lot? Yeah, this one has a bunch of layers. You know, it's got the carving, it's got the, the wall tape, it's got some die cut pieces and the bottle cap, and it's got a couple um, levels of die cut. There's just not one level. There's, you know, a couple circles stacked up on top of each other. But that's not to say that you can't go back and add more. I mean, just because we're painting this now with the, I'm, I'm, I'm not done with this. This has got a way to go for me. With mixed media, more is more is more is more. <laughs> more is good. And other mediums, maybe not so much. I know I love watercolor also, but sometimes with watercolor, less is more. You can overpaint something and tickle it to death and it, it just is too much. So now what I also do, see sometimes if I go right to the edge, I'm not quite, you know, I can get all kinds of dirty here. So if I hold this under my hand, I can try and get it without ruining the surface, but I'm trying to get this blow down for you. Now I just wanna stipple this and just get the blue in there like that. So there's some areas that don't have the paint and I'm gonna let that dry. Now they make a lot of, 
find that one up here. Things that you can add to the surface once it's dry. This I'm proud. This blue one I just completed here. I'm probably not going to play with this for a while because the paint's got to dry. If I wanted to add, see how I have like I've gone around the edges with some of these metallic. This stuff is called stickles. It comes in a little tube kind of thing. It almost looks like an eye drops would come in that kind of little tub thing, little, not a tube, it's like a little bottle with a squirty top. And it adds sparkle and it also adds dimension. And this is, I don't know what this is, but I do have something that I just pulled out. I have a collection of all this stuff. This is a snow writer. And it's for 3D effects. So let's see what this is all about. This open. Oh, the other thing I wanted to share with you. If you find that you're always scrambling and looking for your tools, this is the greatest thing I bought. And I don't know if it's still available, but you could make inquiry. I know that I piled it up with all other stuff. This is a toolbox, little toolkit, and it has, it has a cover that slides over this. This was sold to me by one of my teachers. She makes them. I think it was $80 with all the tools. Sharon Payne Bolton. I'll try and remember to, I'll remember that to put that in the email. So it, it comes, you can elect to get it just the, the wood, or you can get it with the tools. It comes with holes for the scissors, your bone folder. It's got all these cool clips that are great for when you're clamping things and having things dry. It's got an awl, which makes holes. It's, it's good for bookmaking, another lethal weapon, uh, an exacto knife, little mini screwdriver, paintbrush, uh, I think it comes with a sanding block, which is great if you want to rub away a surface. It's just not for um, like roughing out corners, but let's see if I can find some an area that I want to rough up. All right, let's see. If I want to remove paint from an area, We'll be doing this over my keyboard. Um, let's try this one. If I want to remove paint from an area. I can take sand, like sandpaper to it and it will rough it up. It'll be like, if, you know, like if I clawed it at, with something. So I like using a sanding block if I'm trying to, sometimes when you have, when you cut, you might get a rough edge. So it's just, you know, it's like an emery board, just like when you have a hangnail or a rough edge on your nail. Sanding block is good to have. Um, a book binding. Oh, and this brayer. Little cool thing, brayer. So if you have, if you're using a gel press or um, you want to smooth something down or even roll out paint, this is not good for paint though. This is like a smush and smush it down brayer. Um, I don't know if I would use this for paint unless I was using acrylic paint on a gel press. Are you familiar with the gel press? Has anyone used a jelly press? All right, I'm gonna send you a link for it. The most fun thing in the world. Um, I used to teach a class on it where I would bring them and, and turn people on to them. Um, I'll send you a link because it's just so fun. What I like about a gel press, which is a lot of things I like in mixed media too, you're not responsible for making the art. The art is kind of made for you. So, okay. Um, even though this area is stenciled, on a gel press, you, it, it's like a squishy surface. 
Um, the only thing that I, that it's like the stuff that sex toys are made out of. <laughs> and, and you roll the paint under and it can take impressions. What I love to do is take like bubble wrap and, and, and then you put your paper down um good side down so print side down and rub it and then when you peel it up you see all these cool textures i can't articulate how cool it is i will definitely send you a link it is so fun and um i think you taught that in a class that carol took and she really liked that yeah i think i think, that was I think she was in that class too uh -huh. Um, I've done that in a couple of schools and, but you know, I'm not teaching them live classes now. So, um, and if I do go back to live classes, I really don't want to schlep all the art supplies that I used to. I had a wagon, it was like a fold up wagon and I'd be pulling that thing like somebody who's spending the day at the beach. I mean, it's like this huge wagon full of art supplies. Because my whole premise when I started teaching art, I said, I want to teach the kind of class that I want to take, that I want to take. And my favorite classes that I've been taking um, were, were from Sharon Payne Bol Bolton. And she supplies all the materials. All I had to do was show up. And I said, this is great. And the reason that she instituted that policy in her class that she would bring all the materials is because everybody's working with the same thing. So um, right now I'm teaching a watercolor class in Zoom and not everybody has two watercolors. Some people have those little pans. Some people have watercolor pencils. So when you're all using the same stuff, it makes my job easier as a teacher. And it also um, gets the results more consistent. Like if, if you want a, your results to look like my results, then you've got to use the tools I'm using because the tools are the half of it. <laughs> So anyway, I will send a link for this. I This is one of my favorite investments because it's so handy. It's right here and everything is right here. Even though on my big area over my wall unit, I've got big bins of you know scissors and um, washi tape and all kinds of things. But right here, when I just need one little tool and my favorite tool, it's right here next to where I'm working. You could probably make that whole thing yourself if, you, if you're that handy. So now getting back to this snow writer, I hope this works. You know, there, I don't think there's ever been a class in my whole life where I haven't had at least one epic fail when it comes to a demo. So we're going to see. And this is kind of like, this isn't dried up. Yeah, it might be dried up. I got it before COVID. I think it's dried up. Shoot. All right, let me open it. Um, anyway, the idea is you squeeze this stuff out. Oh, yeah, this is all dry. All right. So if this wasn't dry, I should have checked it before. I was so excited. I would squeeze it out and just go around where you kind of like cake icing if you're decorating cookies and and you have to let it dry overnight well this can go right in the garbage um with a lot of mixed media there is a lot of drying time and patience involved on on this book, I glued down my letters, my 3D letters. You can see they're maybe of an eighth of an inch high. And then when they were all glued down, I went over with the stickles, which, you know, that little tuba, and they come, they, they're not all glitter, but I just happened to have some that were glitter. And I'm not a huge glitter fan, but I do like a little sparkle. Like in here on the back, it's got a little bit of sparkle to it, some iridescent. Um, and I put some silver in the channels 
of the corrugation. Now, as a book cover, what I would do, like if you, if you have prints that you want to make into a book, this book is just eight and a half by 11 pieces of paper. So to demonstrate, here's, you know, like three pieces of copy paper. Take these gloves off now. So I've got three pieces of copy paper and let's pretend that these are prints or paintings or mixed media things. I now am going to fold them in half and I've got a booklet. Each one of these eight and a half pieces of paper, this is called a signature in bookmaking. It's four pages. So all of a sudden my three drawings, my three prints, my three paintings now folded in half, I've got a 12 page booklet. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. So I've had students who, oh, they get so excited. I, you know, I, I made 15 prints and I said, that's going to be a 60 page book. I just, you just need to know that. So don't feel like you have to um, make all these things. Now, once you stack one inside the other, the only place where they're going to be the same is the centerfold because everything else is going to be stacked. Like where's, where's my point on this? I had, some, so this orange page that was what the next to the back, the next to the, oh, they stuck together. This orange page, really is the other half of it is this orange page because when you stack them and you lay them down on top of each other and you don't even need to have all your pages be the same this little I stuck this little guy in the middle but now you have all these pages and what I like to do when I have this this is still a little wet but I can handle it if I did a front and I did a back, a front and a back, <laughs> I now would take a strip of fabric to make my, and glue it down with matte medium to make my binding and leave a gap in the middle, like a, like a quarter of an inch, depending on how many pages I have because that now, as you can see, I used a piece of fabric here. There's one with greater contrast. This one has greater contrast in the fabric. So then when I lay my pages in here, and this, is, this, only, has, um, this only has three pages. This book has three pages of prints, but it's a 12 page book. And then when I lay them in, I take my awl, that tool, and I make holes and I thread my book binding through and tie it. And I like to tie it at the top so I can add little dingle dangles to it. And this is like some old sari fabric and, and it makes the book more interesting. So a lot of these pages were made on a gel press with stencils and um, some of them have stamps. And then you bind them in a book because I find that many times I have so many, oh, I love to make prints. I love to make this. This is a cool page. What are you gonna do with them? You got a basket or a box full of prints. If you, I guarantee you, if you were to make a book like this and just leave it on your coffee table or open or laying down and you have people come over 
they're going to immediately notice this and pick this up and say, oh my goodness, this is just so cool. And I love these prints. It's a great way to showcase it because otherwise your prints are just going to stay in a basket and nobody's going to see them. So I have a whole bookcase full of um, journals that I've made and art books of prints and collages. And when they're lined up in the on the bookcase, they look really cool because they have this thing. And they just draw people people's attention like, wow, that's a cool book. And I look at that, it's like, of course, of course I want you to look at my artwork. So that's where I was going with using this to make a cover. But this could be the basis for an artwork in and by itself. This could be your substrate. You could do collaging on here. You could add more to it. Um, so that's why I packed the corrugated and the insecto knife and all that in there for you. So I think we're running out of time. Are there, are there any questions, anything you want me to review before our, our session is over? Well, it has been such a pleasure having you take this class and playing with these techniques with me. And I will keep you abreast of any classes I'm teaching. I'm teaching a watercolor class, three watercolor sessions in January. I'll send you an email link on that. But I'm going to take February off. I'll be in Florida. And then when I come back in March and April, I'll, I'll be doing some Zoom, not just through Chappaqua, but through Scarsdale as well. So I'll, I'll send you email links. It doesn't matter. You don't have to be a resident, as you well know, Kathleen. Um, you don't have to be a resident of those school districts to take the classes. So you could take classes from anywhere as long as it's Zoom. So thank you so much for thank your you time. Very much. Yes, thank you so much. It's been so fun. Thank it you. has been fun for me. I hope it has been for you as well. And I hope to see you in the future. Be well. Enjoy a wonderful holiday season ahead. And I'll see you next year. All right. All right. Thank Take, you care. All. Take care. Take care. Bye, Cassie. Bye. 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 Let me hit end record.